Hey, I'm James. Welcome to Game Stories, where we write games that tell stories. And today we're going to focus on branching narratives. In order to do that, I'm going to make a distinction between linear narratives, nonlinear narratives, and branching narratives. And then I'll look at the history of branching narratives in print, which is where they begin. They begin in the 1940s with the fiction of uh, Jorge Luis Borges in Argentina. Uh, and we'll look at some history of that with some modern stuff too. Uh, and then we'll look at a platform called Twine and start making our own stuff. So to get started, uh, a linear narrative, a nonlinear narrative, and a branching narrative. What's the difference between those three? Well, a linear narrative is a story that takes place in chronological order. It starts at the beginning of the series of events, and it gets ends at the end of that series of events, and each event in the series is in the order that it happened in time, right? For example, if I told you a story about a woman who wakes up in the morning and gets ready for work, then goes downstairs and says goodbye to her husband and her school-age kids, then gets in the car, drives to work, gets in a horrible car accident, wakes up in a hospital bed 30 years later, uh, and then is shocked and sad to see the faces of her now adult children standing around her bedside. The end, right? That's a linear narrative because it starts at the beginning and it ends at the end. Uh, and even though there's a big gap in time, there's this big 30 year jump between when she gets in the car accident and when she wakes up again, uh, that jump in time doesn't go backwards, right? It doesn't go back to before that morning or um, it doesn't scramble the, the timeline at all. It just says, Here's the next thing that happens in the story. It just happens to be forward in time. So what does that look like in a video game um, or in any kind of game? Well, Jesse Schell, game designer and author of this book right here, The Art of Game Design, describes this as, I'm gonna show you the little thing that he draws here. He describes it as a string of pearls. You can see that little diagram there with an arrow and a circle and then an arrow and a circle and an arrow and a circle. In this diagram, the arrows are the story and the circles are the game. So it goes a little bit of story, a little bit of game, a little bit of story, a little bit of game, a little bit of et cetera, right? That's a string of pearls. And it just tell, it's, a, it's any game that has a story that happens in a straight line when the story interrupts the gameplay uh, or the gameplay interrupts the story. Right? So you're going along in, in, in this narrative and then, oh, you got to solve a puzzle. Or you got to beat up all these bad guys. Or you have to win this race. And then when you do, you get a little bit more of the story and you're taken to the next interactive moment when you can do more game stuff. And it goes like that throughout the game. Let's look at an example really quick. There's a lot of examples of this. Like I think probably most games that bother to tell a story or focus on a story probably do it this way. Uh, and here's one of them. Where'd it go? This is the Silent Age. It's a point and click adventure uh, that's sort of, well, I won't spoil anything about it, but it's fun. It's, it's, worth, it's worth checking out if you get a chance. So you start as this guy right here in your red jumpsuit. You're a janitor. You work for this corporation. Uh, you can kind of click to move around and do stuff. Uh, when you do, you sort of discover some facts about the world around you. Like if you read this note, it says up here, there's a sticky note. It says, Joe, Mr. Hill wants to see you, Frank. So I'm Joe. There's a Mr. Hill. He wants to see me. If I click on the elevator door, well, it says I need my blue access card to get in there. So I don't have that yet. If I click, uh, it's not going to tell me, is it? Oh, yeah. 23rd floor offices, the top management floor where Mr. Hill's office is. So I clicked on something and I find out where I have to get. I have to get up this elevator, but I need my blue key card. So let's try this yellow door and see what we get. We get to go into the supply room, which is dark. If I try to turn on the light, it's going to tell me no light. I should change the light bulb. If I grab this light bulb off the shelf over here and then use it to change the light bulb, then I can turn on the light and look at that. Look at that on the table. Now I can grab 
my blue key card and go back out into the hallway and I think you can probably figure out what happens next here I'm gonna take the blue key card and I'm gonna put it in this thing and the elevator is gonna open then I can go up and I can see Mr. Hill if I already spoiled too many of the puzzles for you I'm sorry uh, but this is an example of a linear story Joe here is gonna have some kind of encounter with Mr. Hill that's gonna lead him to a series of adventures and misadventures uh, all of which kind of are interrupted by the same kind of puzzle solving that we just witnessed, right? There's an objective, go see Mr. Hill. And there's a series of, of locks and keys in the way of that objective. Uh, I need to see Mr. Hill, but he's up the elevator. In order to go up the elevator, I need the key card. In order to get the key card, I have to put the light bulb in because it's dark. So I grab the light bulb, change the light bulb, turn on the light, grab the key card, put the key card in the elevator thing, and I go up, right? That, that is more or less pearls on a string. There's a story to be told here, but it's interrupted by interactive elements that won't let me get to the next piece of the story until I solve that part of the gameplay. Okay, so there you have it. That's linear narrative. Let's see if we can quit out of that. Yes, I really do. Okay, linear narrative. Non-linear narrative is quite a bit, well, it's not too different because it'll tell basically a story that is a single story that you can reconstruct and put in order of time but the way that the game or the novel or the person or or whatever is telling the story the time order is all scrambled up so maybe it starts in the middle and then it jumps back to something earlier and then it jumps way in the future and then it all the different pieces in the order that I'm telling it to you are scrambled in time order so if I told you the same story about the lady in the car accident and the kids, I might say a woman wakes up in uh, the hospital bed. There's some adults standing around her. She looks at them and she cries. Jump back to the same woman waking up in her own bed, getting ready for work, saying goodbye to her children, et cetera, et cetera, getting in the car accident. And then we connect the dots, right? We realize, oh, those kids or those people that were standing in there were her kids. and. We get a slightly different effect, a slightly different dramatic effect, or create a different kind of puzzle for the reader or the player by putting time events out of order and making the reader do some mental work to reassemble the time order of the story. The story itself, if there is a story itself, still happens within a timeline, but we've scrambled the presentation so that people have to figure it out. Let's look at an example. This is 30 Flights of Loving, uh, which is a fantastic game. Oh, am I going to be able to see this? Yeah. It's about as small as I can make it. This is, this is maybe one of the only examples that I can think of, of a kind of cinematic version of nonlinearity in, in, a, in a game narrative. The gameplay itself is really straightforward and linear, but the story it tells and the way that it tells it is completely nonlinear. So, first person game, you walk around and essentially you encounter a series of interactive spaces, which then link to still more interactive spaces. So here's this kind of bar, and I can, I can drink all this booze. I could jump over the bar. The guy's got a gun back there, I can take that. Notice this little picture right here that lets me interact with it. That's the way out to get me to the next, uh, the next interactive scene, right? So I go down here through this passageway, and I enter this space where there's a couple characters staring at me. They've got guns, which I can take, and bullets. I can take a bunch of. I can also drink their booze. Uh, and I can interact with them too. Look at this. So this is Borges, interestingly enough. When I interact with him, it gives me some quick flashes from his life, which are out of order, but all, and also labeled. So they tell me these are the skills this guy has. The same thing will happen over here for Anita. If I click on her, I get that she's a demolitions expert, a mechanic, a sharpshooter, and a confectioner. She makes cakes. If I explore the environment, I can learn that it looks like we're planning some kind of a heist or something at an airfield. We got all these 
cool things here. Uh, and then the only way out of this scene is to walk down here and hop on the plane. Then they come out and fly away with me. So, so far, linear story, right? Found a bar, got on an airplane with these people. We're going to go somewhere. And then all of a sudden, there's this jump. I don't know what happened in between getting on the plane now, uh, but Anita's been shot, and she's trying to shoot me. So something funky must have happened. Is she a traitor? Am I a traitor? Um, did we just get mad at each other and decide to sh have a big shootout? I don't know. Let's look around. But it appears like this is the end of whatever caper we were trying to pull, and that it has gone really wrong. Here's Borges. So I can pick him up. The only way out of this room is to pick him up and open this door. I'm going to keep playing just for another minute to show you one more jump. There's a hallway here. I can go three different directions, left, right, or kind of down these stairs. It doesn't matter which way I go in actuality because wherever I go, it's going to jump me to this hallway where people are moving very fast. And I can only escape from by going forward. And then it just shoots me into this room where I have to come up here and interact with this thing to put Borges on the luggage rack. And we can really zoom around together. Again, there's sort of a branch here. There's two ways to go, but no matter which way I choose, it puts me in the same spot, which is lying down in this room, staring across the space at a woman peeling oranges and throwing the peels out the window. What happened, right? Well, when I go over here and look, I can see that it's Anita. She has her jacket off, but she's not shot. So I'm going to guess that this happened before any of it, before the planning, before I found that bar, before she got shot and started trying to shoot me. And there's just a quiet moment here where we're hanging out. And she's throwing stuff out the window. I can go out here. I can jump off, but I'm not going to because it just restarts here. If I eventually explore over here, I can see what time it is. And when I go forward, time jumps. There's sort of a chit chat here. And then they're going to go upstairs to this party where he's bringing the booze and she brought the cake. That's as far as I think we'll take it right now. Um, that's what I mean by like a, a cinematic version of nonlinearity, where in movies they'll do flash forwards and flashbacks and jump you around in time. I've never quite seen that in games the same way until I played 30 Flights of Loving, where you're playing through an order of events and all of a sudden, boop, you're jumped to the end of the caper. You don't have any idea what happened in between. And then as you're trying to escape this pretty dramatic, horrible situation, it jumps you immediately back to much quieter time before any of this happened. And as it kind of jumps back and forth and through time, it starts to tell you the story about who these three characters are and what kind of relationship they have with each other. A lot is left to speculation, but there's enough clues that you can kind of, you can kind of start to piece together maybe some of what happened during the, during the events. I want to show you one more non-linear game because uh, this is one of my favorite story games of all time. And to do that, I have to kind of disappear for a second. Can I do this? Yes. I have to go to my phone and load it up. It should show you. Yeah. Okay. So this is her story. And in this game, you just have a database. You're trying to figure out something that happened and figure out what happened. You got to use this database. It comes preloaded with the search word murder. And when you click search, it queries and you get some videos of this lady. You can tell that she's wearing different clothes. So they're probably on different days. And when you pick one of them, you can play it and she'll talk, right? And when she talks, you're just going to listen to how she answers the question. You don't know what the question is. And based on that, uh, you can maybe come up with some other Oh man, I don't even know what to search without giving up too much away. Um, let's put hair maybe. See if there's anything for hair. Ooh, look, there is stuff for hair. 
I won't search anything else because I'll start spoiling things if I do. Um, but that's this is the whole game, is watching clips of these interrogation or, or questioning videos, trying to figure out what keywords to search for in the database that will pull up more of these clips. And notice that these clips are not in chronological order, they're just all of the clips that relate to that keyword. So they could be all over the place in time. And as you're watching these clips and taking notes about what happened and trying to solve this kind of mystery, you're also trying to put these clips in chronological order. Sometimes you can do that. Let's see. Oh, that's not going to work. Um, you can see the date stamp there. And then you can also look at the way that she's in her hair or the clothes that she's wearing to kind of get clues about what's going on. The backstory for this is, of course, a linear story. It's it's the series of interviews that she's talking about, and then beyond that, the 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 series of events that she describes in those in in these interviews. Um, but the presentation is completely scrambled, right? You can you can approach this in any order you want and get this information in any in any way, depending on the search terms that you use. So that is nonlinearity right in games which two pretty creative examples I think um, for how to do that linearity is tell a little bit of story interrupt the story with some interactivity tell a little more story interrupt it again with interactivity nonlinearity is the parts of the story are all scrambled up uh, the game the game play might be really linear like in 30 flights of loving or it might be nonlinear itself as in the case with her story where you're basically interacting with the database and piecing things together. Okay, so linear, nonlinear, but what about branching narrative? Well, a branching narrative, unlike linear and nonlinear stories, can't really be, hmm, normally can't really be pieced back together as a single narrative. It's really a bunch of narratives stuck together and which particular narrative comes out, which particular story comes out depends entirely on the player choices. So there's lots of choices in her story, and there's even some choices in um, well, all of the games that we looked at. But in those games, when you make choices, the story stays the same. In branching narratives, you make choices, and the story becomes different because of your choices. Let's look at an example of that. This is the Stanley Parable which is a very funny game. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear it. I'll turn it up a bit. Maybe maybe the mic will catch some of this. Um, but it's a game, you're an office worker, and you uh, are at your desk punching this key on the computer board and realize that all of your coworkers are gone. You don't know where they are. You don't know where they went. Uh, and so it starts with this little bit of mystery. We're gonna like, skip. This is One of the key features of this uh, video game is the narrator who's gonna talk over the gameplay at all times. So I don't know if you can all hear him. What could, it mean? what could it mean? You can see the, the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. Uh -oh, did I get lost? Yep. So he's telling me to go to the meeting room. Maybe I missed a memo. Maybe all my coworkers are there. On my way to the meeting room, I'm going to enter this room with two doors. When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. And the narrator tells me to go left. But I don't have to go left. He just tells me to go left. I can make the other choice and go down this way, see what happens. Or I can just follow along and do what the narrator tells me and go this way. If I do, I'll arrive at the meeting room and find it empty. Yet there was not a single person here either. Feeling a wave of disbelief, Stanley decided to go up to his boss's office, hoping he might find an answer there. And the narrator tells me to go to my boss's office, and again I'm met with case, binary choice. To his boss's office. Guy tells me to go upstairs, boss's office is upstairs, but again I don't have to go that way, I can go down here instead. I can deviate from whatever the apparent narrative is, right? I can go down this way and just see what happens. Oh, 
happens is I get a little bit of story. And eventually, I'll notice that some of these rooms keep repeating themselves. Been by this car before. I can't go back. But when I go forward, there we go. Why can't I see my feet? It's a funny joke about first-person shooters. Another joke about the game. So, anyway, he's going to tell me that, oh, I'm dreaming, and this sort of a dream ending. Uh, and I go around that loop a bunch of times while he's talking, and, and that's kind of, that's the end of the story, right? Is it ends that way. Um, if I begin the game again, and they go a different way, I'll get a different story. A different kind of story will come out. Uh, and it's all based on the branches that I choose in this 3D space. So I don't know. I mean, there's there's many, many, many endings to this, and I'm not, we're not going to be able to look at them all, but let's just go one other way and see how the game reacts when we do something different than expected this time. Same premise, same co-workers are gone, where did they go? Same, uh, did I get myself backwards? Yeah, I keep turning myself around in this. Same premise, same missing co-workers, same two-door choice, same guy that says to go to the left. We'll make a different choice. So he's going to start to make jokes about how I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. And a little further on, uh, he tells me to go take the first door to the left, and I can go that way to get whatever that story is going to be. It's going to be different than the, the other story. Uh, or I can go this way and get some other kind of story. Stanley was so bad at following directions, it's incredible he wasn't five years ago. And this door opens for me, so I can kind of go out here. And he'll just keep making jokes about how I'm doing the wrong thing or some other weird thing will happen. And this thing will take me across that area, or I can jump off and get over to this area that's in front of me. Anyway, th there's a 3D space that I can navigate a bunch of different ways. It gives me uh, a series of setups that are binary choices, uh, and if I go one way, the story branches in that direction. If I go a different way, the story branches in that direction. That's a branching narrative. The story of the Stanley Parable will change depending on what I do. Now, if you, if you play all the branches, then it kind of builds up, in, in the Stanley Parable's case, it builds up into one big story, right? Which is the story of you playing this game and not doing what the narrator says, and it's kind of a meta-narrative reflection on player agency and whether or not you're in control or the game is in control, and it's really quite good and funny. Um, but any in individual play, the story is going to be different uh, depending on which choice you make. Whereas with her story, the story is going to be the same every time you play, even if you search in a different order uh, and find different stuff. And the same is true with um, all the other games. The, the story will be the same no matter how you play it, but Stanley Parable, not so much. Yep. So, linear narrative. Oh no, I need to stop that sound. Okay, linear narrative, branching narrative, uh, linear narrative, nonlinear narrative, and branching narrative. Linear t tells everything in a straight line. Uh, nonlinear has a story that is singular and in, in a straight line, but scrambles up the presentation. And branching narrative has many narratives, and it gives them over to you to make choices about which one you want to see based on the choices you make inside the text. Where did that idea come from? Uh, it came from a dude called Jorge Luis Borges. In the 1940s, he published a book of short fiction called English Ficciones or something. Um, and in it, there was this uh, story called The Works of Herbert Quain. There was actually this and another one called The Garden of Forking Paths or something like that. But it's really in, in this story where he shows what a branching narrative could be. 
Uh, this is a fake uh, obituary of an author who didn't exist. And he sort of describes Quain's work and what it's all about. And as he does so, he comes across this. A novel that can be told, there's actually nine different novels contained within the same book. The first chapter, Z in this graph, is always the same. And then chapter, the, the next three chapters are all different directions that could be taken from that first chapter. Three possible se following sequences from Z. And then after those chapters are nine chapters, and you can see each of which, each, each, <laughs> each Y chapter has a set of three X chapters that could follow from it. And he describes this in a really interesting way. He says, uh, the work in, its entire, uh, work in its entirely consists then of nine novels, each novel of three long chapters. The first chapter is common to all, of course. Of those novels, one is symbolic, another supernatural, another a detective novel, another psychological, another a communist novel, another an anti-communist, and so on. And he gives us the symbolic structure. So depending on which chapters the reader decides to read, they're gonna read a novel of only three chapters long, but the genre will change, right? If I go off this way, maybe I get into the political stuff and then here it concludes communist, here it concludes anti-communist, here it concludes something else, some sort of mix. Um, I don't know exactly how this would work, neither does he, because he just describes it and he doesn't execute on it. But this is the beginning of the idea that you can have in a story, many stories, and that the reader might be able to do something to to choose that. Then the other story in this book, um, Garden of Forking Paths, is kind of all about how confusing this idea is. I won't tell the whole story, but uh, the premise is that, or the core of it is that there's this book that no one has understood for a hundred years, basically, uh, until this scholar realizes mm -hmm. that it is a labyrinth and tries to tell uh, all of the possible events sort of simultaneously that follow from a single starting event. Um, and so it's another take, it's another, another conceptual um, version of the same idea that, that Borges is working with. So it starts with him, and uh, at least in his head, right? He describes these things but doesn't do them. The first, uh, yeah, the, I guess the next piece to look at here is Hopscotch by Julio Cortazar. Uh, which comes with this nice table of instructions for how to read it. This is a novel, and, well, here, I'll just read this to you. You can read it in two ways. In its own way, this book consists of many books, but two books above all. The first can be read in a normal fashion, and it ends with chapter 56, at the close of which there are three garish little stars which stand for the words of the end. Consequently, the reader may ignore what follows with a clean conscience. In other words, you could just read the book straight forward from chapter 1 to chapter 56, or whatever he said. Then he says the second novel should be read by beginning with chapter 73 and then followed in this sequence indicated at the end of each chapter. So instead of starting with 1, you can start with 73, then read chapters 1 and 2, then 116, then 3, then 84, then 4, then 71, then 5. And it's going to end up being a very different novel. In fact, a much longer novel, because we go back a little bit, we'll see that there's 155 chapters here. So if you only read the first 56 or so, you're only reading a third of the chapters in the book. And while this isn't quite a branching narrative, right? This is not players making choices, but it is sort of the first effort to make a book full of different stories. And you can choose from the beginning, story A or story B, shorter and straightforward, longer and maybe more meandering back and forth through the book. Um, but you don't really know at the outset what that's gonna look like. He does say maybe it contains many stories, so in theory I guess you could choose to read the chapters out of order, but he gives you a prescribed order, two prescribed orders to choose from at the beginning. Um, so when do we get the first story that actually branches the way that, for example, Stanley Parable branches? Um, I believe we get it here with Raymond Quineau. Uh, in kind of the, the late 1960s, he writes this little story called A Story As You Like It. Uh, and it goes, it's, it's structured in a series of passages that are numbered. 
And in each passage, there is a choice. This sort of binary choices that direct you to another passage that is also numbered. This is a technology that's going to be central to game books in the future. Um, and it starts first right here. It's not a very interesting story. I'll tell you that. It's sort of about peas in a garden and bean poles and stuff. Uh, but it still is important in the history of, of branching narratives because for the first time you have passages and choices and different kinds of stories that can come out of this thing. So we'll come back to this in a little bit. Where do story games go next? Um, actually, right around the same time, a little bit later than that, there's another one by John Sladek. Where is this? Out of maps. Uh, the Lost No is a programmed book, and it does. It's also not a super amazing story, but it's sort of zany and and random. But it is the same thing as Quino, right? It says that you're gonna read from big, and it also adds this, I guess, which is it has paragraphs that are numbered and branching choices, and you jump around between them. Uh, and then when you get to a passage marked at the end, that's the end of the story. Quino's I don't think quite does that. I think they all kind of filter down into the same ending. Um, so this is different stories with different possible ends, 21 of them, right? Which is an, an advance over what Quinault was doing. Um, let's see, if we get to the, did I mark the end of this? Yeah, so at the end of it, he, he does something which will look really familiar when we get to Twine, which is he maps, he maps the uh, relationships between these passages. Start here at one, and then you can go off in this way, or you can go off in that way, and you can see all these different endings to the story here, right? Again, that's going to be really important as we go forward. So that gets us into the late 60s. Uh, late 70s, we get, uh, we get these, something that we looked at in the last video in the, in the first deep dive. Uh, these are Choose Your Own Adventure books, which are structured very much like the John Sladek story, the map story. They have branches. In fact, you can see on the back of this one, it, does a map very similar to the one that Sladek drew, right? It's got branches, it's got choices, and endings in different places. Uh, some of which are good, some of which are bad. You might reread the story to get a different ending if you're unhappy with it. These are sort of marketed to the young adult readers and were really popular when I was a kid. I don't know how popular they are now. Those first came out in 1976 with a book called Sugar Cane Island by Edward Packard and something else important happened for branching narratives in 1976 which was this buffalo castle for tunnels and trolls tunnels and trolls was kind of a you know kind of a knockoff of dungeons and dragons uh, it's a fantasy role playing system that's a little bit different uh, and this was a solo adventure the first solo rpg ever as far as i can tell and it does what the Sladex story and the choose your Own adventures do although it claims to be before choose your Own adventures even though they were published in the same year. Um, it has passages that are numbered and lettered in this case. Then it has choices about where you can go. But beyond that, it also ha adds a little bit more of a game element. Let's go to 4A here. There's random outcomes. You need to use your RPG character. You have to use dice. You, there's combat. So there's this yawning troll that we ran into. If you want to fight him, we go to 7A. And at 7A, it will give us his stats, right? He's got a monster rating of 40. And if we kill him, we're supposed to go to 17A. If we don't, game over. So the game can end even when the story doesn't end. The, the game can kill you out of the story, depending on how well you're prepared for these different challenges that you run into. Uh, and there are different endings here as well, especially unexpected ones where you can just sort of die. So branching narratives are evolving and they're getting more sophisticated. Uh, there's a whole series of game books and I don't, I wish I had this to show you. I'm pretty sure the first book only, the, the book that combined sort of what Tunnels and Trolls was doing with solo adventures and what Choose Your Own Adventure was doing with, with its stuff was a book by Steve Jackson called um, Wizard of Firetop Mountain, something like that. It was the first uh, fighting fantasy book and it had you rolled dice you had character stats and stuff and you had uh, choose your own branching narrative structures but you didn't have to have an rpg game rules with it um, here's here's an example of that kind of book this is 
Fire on the Water by Joe Dever. It's book number two in the Lone Wolf series. And this series was pretty popular for this kind of book. Um, it starts with some rules, not as heavy as what you would get in an RPG. And then it has passages, just like in the Tunnels and Trolls, where, well, it has passages where you make choices and you can turn to different pages. But it also has passages here, like, that have monsters with combat skill and hit points, endurance points. And you have a random table at the back of the book where you're picking random numbers to see if you win and how to resolve the battle. So you had basically RPG light inside of a Choose Your Own Adventure books evolving. Um, one fun example of that is the one-on-one -on -one adventure series by TSR. I haven't played through this yet, but it looks pretty cool. Games with two books, and you have to play this with two players. One player is going to be this cool robot dude, and one's going to be this like ninja star space guy. And you're both going to start on different ends of the same star map and do a choose your own adventure game as you go through uh, but also having combat and battles and stuff so it's a little more sophisticated uh, than the choose your own adventures and even more sophisticated than like the joe dever books and stuff these are still being written and made uh, in different ways i'll show you some examples this is way of the tiger book number five Warbringer, uh, and it has you're sort of like a fantasy ninja in these books uh, but it has a pretty advanced system that sort of like gives you all these tactical combat options and then also later in the book oh man yeah you have these maps uh, battle maps where you have to make really uh, broad strategic and then tactical decisions about the way this battle is going to unfold and stuff so kind of advanced stuff here um, this is Ryan North's To Be or Not To Be it's a choose your own adventure implementation of Hamlet and you can play as Hamlet or Ophelia or the dead ghost king there. Uh, it's pretty funny. It's basically just choosing your adventure. This is Heart of Ice. This is the last one I'll show by Dave Morris. Um, Sci-fi story where you're all kind of, there's a bunch of adventurers hunting for this thing. There's no dice in this one, but it does have a pretty sophisticated um, code word system that it uses to determine what kinds of options are available to you depending on who your character is. So it's manages to do role play in an interesting way without having to do random number stuff. Impressive thing. We'll probably come back to this later. Okay, that's all that's all of that. So branching narrative begins in the 40s with this concept and it kind of evolves over time in these books. Not just in books, obviously, because we have um, we have, for example, the Stanley Parable, right? Which is a a video game so it shows up in different places <sighs> right so let's make some if you want to make your own branching narrative I don't think there's a better way to do it than to start working in twine unless you just want to use pencil and paper but this is easier than that this is twinery.org where you can use twine online I recommend though that you download it onto your computer for reasons I'll show you why in just a second in fact I strongly recommend that you just download it because if you use it online, it's going to start by giving you some warnings. Oh, no, it's not because it's I've already started with it. Dang. Um, I'll give you some warnings. Uh, if you use this online and you create a big story file and then you erase your cookies in your browser or you open it up, open up a different browser and access Twine or you open up a different computer and try to access Twine your story won't be there. And if you've deleted your cookies and erased your history or whatever on your browser, I think your story's gone forever. Because Twine Online is saving directly to your browser's cache. It's cached in your browser memory. I don't really know how this stuff works, but it's, it's not on your hard drive. In order to get it on your hard drive, here, I'll show you whatever these weird stories are. Test one. Uh, if you are using it online and you you want to save it in some way, you have to, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. Let's bring it up. You have to click on the name of the story and then click publish to file. It will then download an HTML file, which you can then re-upload here, import story from file. You have to kind of do that every single time you use it. It's, it's a hassle. So I prefer to use Twine not online. Let's open Twine not online. And I'll show you the really basics of how to use this. This is the downloaded version. It looks exactly the same, right? Except for you don't have to worry about, can I delete my browser cookies or not? 
is my story still going to be there? So let's make a new story. We'll just call it <clears throat> test story, like those other ones were. We'll add it, and it'll open up this handy little blue space where I can start building a map of the kinds of stories I want to put in this one. When I hover over, I get some options. I can delete this. Don't do that. I can edit it. I can debug it starting from this point, or I can set it as the launch point of the story, which I want it to be. I want this to be the first passage. So let's edit it. And we'll call, we'll just call it start. And we can double click to edit. If you delete, it's going to give you some basic stuff about how to do bold and italics and different markup stuff. Um, but that's not going to stay as soon as we start typing. So let's just say the dog was in the yard looking at butterflies. Flies. Pretty cool story so far. Let's give the dog some choices. The dog decided to, to do what? Go inside or jump the fence. You can see that I put those words in double brackets. You can see that when I did that, maybe you can see this, that it changed, these brackets changed from black to blue. That indicates that they're going to do something now. I'm going to do a computer thing. And when I close this passage called start, it's going to generate two more passages for me. So I can go to this go inside passage and double click it. And I can say the dog went inside. Mm -hmm. And I can go to this jump the fence passage and say he was too big. No, he was too small. That makes more sense to get over the fence. But the neighbor boy let him out anyway. What a nice neighbor boy. So when we test this, no. That's not how you test it. You test it by pressing this play button down here. Boop. And it loads a new window. And it loads your story. The dog was in the yard looking at butterflies. The dog decided to. And now look what it did. It, instead of having those brackets around it, it turned these into hyperlinks. Right? So if I click go inside, I get to the passage that says the dog went inside. And if I go instead to jump the fence, it gives me this text. So I can just I can just keep doing that, right? I can say, okay, that's my start passage. And look how fun you can drag them around. That's where these go. When the dog goes inside, he's gonna get some more options. It was nice, but he was hungry. He whined. I don't know if I'm spelling that for his owner. Or poked around in the trash, right? And what are we gonna get? We're gonna get new passages that I can edit and tell that branch of the story. Same thing if I do it over here, right? And I can keep making more branches of stories until I've got this big elaborate pyramid full of choices. You can look at them and these sort of toggle the level of zoom, right? You can look at really small and I can make this massive pyramid of story choices. Uh, so that's it. That's all we're going to do about Twine today. Um, assignment. If you want, uh, here's the deal. If you want to start making these things, and if you're in my class, then you have to start making these things. Uh, do this. Open up a Twine. Download Twine. Please download Twine. Don't, don't get yourself lost online and erase your whole story. Uh, download Twine. Open a new story. Open the start passage with the edit feature. Put whatever kind of story you want. I don't care how random or weird it is. Just start making branches. And I would say this. Always do two choices for each passage. And try to make your story as long as possible. Make, as, make so that any given playthrough of the story is six passages long, 10 passages long, 20 passages long. See how big you can build this pyramid uh, before, you, before you, you lose your mind. Uh, you'll notice something pretty quickly when you start doing that. 
Um, but I want, you, I want you to try it. I want you to try to make as big a story as you can just so you can see what happens when your story branches out so much, right? And the kinds of different threads that it gets into. I also want you to be really familiar with how these basic links work, okay? Well, I guess I'll show you one more thing about, do I need to do this? No, I don't need to, I'll show you more stuff later. So basic links, basic branching, tell a cool story or a really random weird story uh, that branches out as much as you possibly can and then make whatever endings you want as you go. All right, so that's it for now. And I'll be curious to see what y'all make up. And I'll see you next time. Thanks.